Great, thanks. So we've we've heard today. Oops. Um, we've heard about the um, the value of high resolution for capturing convection, for capturing terrain. I learned some about for capturing even groundwater effects. Um, we're going to throw one more thing into the mix today, and as, that is as you go into higher resolution, you also start to resolve lakes better and their effects on, on regional climate and, and indeed convection. So that's, that's what th will be the topic um, here. Um, so first, some little bit of lake effect snow basics, and, and in a way we kind of got a primer for this in, in, in the last talk. This is shallow convective snowfall that's driven by cold air being advected over relatively warm water, much as you just saw over the Sea of Sea of Japan. Um, so here's a little schematic, much like what you just saw. Cold air coming out over a body of water um, that's warmer than the air. Um, that drives low-level instability. So you get turbulence over the water here that's transporting heat and moisture from the lake up into the atmosphere. That then in turn drives convection, which can produce um, often shallow convection that's kind of capped maybe by an inversion, but can produce very intense snowfall. Um, this snowball can, and this can happen not just over lakes, but as you saw, off, also over seas. So this happens all around the world. Um, the snowfall can be very impactful because it can be very intense. Here's a photo from a lake effect snowstorm that happened in near the city of Buffalo off of Lake Erie back in 2014, where over the course of a few days, they received over two meters of snowfall. Um, 10 people lost their lives as a result. Roofs collapsed, highways were closed. Um, it also makes an imprint on the regional climate of the area. Here's the Great Lakes of, of North America, and this is the average annual snowfall. You see these big bullseyes of snowfall down, downwind of the lakes where they can receive twice as much, for instance, as the surrounding areas. So we might ask, how might this phenomena change under, under climate warming? Um, and there's a few reasons why it might change. These tropospheric temperatures might change, affecting the low-level temperature gradients. The lake heat content and ice cover might change, which will also affect the fluxes. And maybe synoptic circulations could change in such a way that you change the frequency or intensity of, of these events. So if we want to simulate this with, uh, with regional models, what are the th attributes we should, we should want in our models to, to capture this, this phenomena? So I would, this is kind of my list that I came up with, what I think is important. One thing is you want to have a good representation of the synoptic forcing for these events. So what's the character of that tropospheric flow that's passing over your lakes? What's its humidity, temperature? I would argue you want to have an explicit um, representation of that, of the lake physics, how the lake heats up and cools down over the course of a season, and have an explicit two-way interaction between that and your atmosphere. Um, as with many things we've talked about um, this week so far, you want to have convection permitting resolution because we're dealing with convection. Um, you also want to have adequate treatment of the, of the snow microphysics. And this region, this interface between the lake and the atmosphere, um, those, those transports are being done by, by small scale turbulence, which also needs to be parameterized. So you want to have an adequate parameterization of that. And that's what I'll focus on a lot in this talk, that last, that last piece. But first, for a little bit of background, um, in terms of some previous studies that have simulated um, this region of the, of the North American Great Lakes and potential climate um, changes in that region. Um, so here's a table I made of three studies. It's not necessarily comprehensive. These first two really focused on lake effect. This third one, which you've been hearing a lot about, is not so focused on lake effect, but it did cover this, this region. So you could use it potentially to look at lake effect. Um, here's what models they used, WARF and, uh, and REG CM4. Um, they all use different kinds of forcing, either GCM time slices or multi-GCM PGW perturbations. They differ, though, in their horizontal grid spacing. You see those top two um, studies use non-convection permitting um, grid spacings, whereas um, this Lou et al. study uses four kilometer um, explicit representation of convection. They also differ a lot in how they treat the physics of the, of the lake, ranging from kind of using a method to prescribe the lake surface um, conditions to using an offline 2D physical lake model that's forced by the driving GCM to using an interactive 1D lake model that can actually communicate with the, with the regional climate model's atmosphere. And they, these two that documented it, they, they used the YSU scheme for PBL turbulence. This third one didn't say 
So here's just an example of, of the result of two of these studies. I'm um, showing the change in snowfall. This one's annual, and this one's January and February. Um, and you see some really different um, results. The one on the left, the Notaro study, shows a decrease in snowfall everywhere, and particularly large decreases in snowfall downwind of the Great Lakes. Whereas this Goulin Peltier study shows, again, that regional decrease in snowfall, but downwind of these Great Lakes, there's these localized increases in snowfall under climate change um, related to increases in lake effect snow intensity. So what we want to understand what drives these uncertainties and how these different modeling choices come into play. Um, I'm not going to comprehensively cover all of those. I'm just going to focus on this last column and look at what the sensitivity of these simulations to surface and boundary layer turbulence parameterizations. So we'll do the kind of case study approach here. I'm looking at a storm off of Lake Superior here. Um, we're using the wharf model, nested domains going down to 1.33 uh, kilometers. Um, we're using analysis, boundary conditions, Thompson microphysics. And we're also prescribing the lake temperature based on a, on a high quality lake analysis product to try to put in the best possible representation that we can. And then we're going to run a whole series of experiments where we do the same simulation, but we switch out the planetary boundary layer and the surface layer turbulence schemes that represent that, that low, lowest level exchanges between the lake and the atmosphere. So here's a table of, of those different runs that we're going to do. Um, so the planetary boundary layer scheme, the surface layer scheme are in those two columns. Most of these schemes in WARF have a kind of a pairing of planetary boundary layer and surface layer schemes. So in those cases, I, I, I put those ones together. For these ones that don't have their own surface layer scheme, I use this revised MM5 scheme um, for them. So I think the previous study used, used this scheme. Several of the other studies we've seen have been using this YSU scheme, just as a reference. OK, so here's an overview of the event we're looking at. Um, Lake Superior is here on this map. This is an 850 hectopascal map. You see the heights and the winds and the, and the temperature and the shading. So you see this north-northwesterly flow bringing really cold air over Lake Superior. We have temperatures around negative 25, negative 30 Celsius. And the lake at this time is still about 4 degrees Celsius. So that's giving you really large lake to mid-troposphere temperature differences to drive convection. And indeed, you get convection. This is a MODIS image showing these horizontal convective rolls, again, similar to what you saw over the Sea of Japan coming off of Lake Superior as that convection develops. And if we zoom in on this, this downstream region, we can look at some radar data to see what the precipitation is coming out of those clouds. And we see these bands that look much like the clouds of, of um, radar reflectivity indicative of snowfall in those, in those bands. So that's just a snapshot. What if we look at the storm total precipitation from stations? You get, you get these maps. And I don't want to worry too much about the numbers. Just want to make the point that we get a lot of snow, so up to 29 millimeters liquid equivalent, 500 millimeters of depth, um, and a lot of spatial variability associated with these narrow bands. And also, the maximum you're finding it really near the coast, and it really decays as you, as you go inland. So how well can we capture these with, with these high resolution simulations? Here's those radar observations again. And now we've got a whole matrix of different model runs. We'll use this as our control. And we've got all these other ones. So broadly, many of them capture this general morphology of the bands, these narrow horizontal convective rolls, much like the radar. Um, a few of them look more like stratiform precipitation. That's not, that's not encouraging. And then this one kind of collapses the bands into fewer and wider um, bands. So there's definitely some differences across the schemes. If we integrate that precipitation over the whole storm, this is what you get. So storm total precipitation, comparing it back to the observations. And we see they're, they're putting the precipitation in the right place on that downwind um, shore. Um, and some of the numbers are, are in the ballpark of the observations. Of course, we have uncertainty in the observations, as Roy will tell you. Measuring snow accurately is, is a problem. So we can't say too much by comparing them directly. But you can compare them to each other, and you can see that there's these schemes that differ from a, almost a factor of two in their amount of snowfall. Just to emphasize that, I make a difference plot of all the runs relative to this MYN N run. And in this case, you're getting differences um, locally that are up to 30 millimeters. So that's on the, on the order of the, what it was in the control. So a factor of two differences in precipitation. So really, really big differences by just changing the surface and boundary layer schemes. 
So we'd like to know what causes this, this large spread among the, among the runs. And the short answer is it's the surface fluxes. Um, this is event averaged sensible heat flux over all the lakes. So first thing to notice is it's large. You, when you have this cold air going over these warm lakes, you get really large fluxes, hundreds of watts per meter squared. But it differs a lot between the schemes. If you look at this MYNN scheme versus this QNSC scheme, and if we just switch to a, a difference plot map again, we're seeing differences that are locally 250 watts per meter squared and average over the whole lake over 100 watts per meter squared. So not, not small differences. Um, you see that in some big differences in some of the other schemes. Other ones ag agree, agree more. So it seems like these sensible heat fluxes are, are really important. Just to emphasize the connection between the, the fluxes and the precipitation, I'm scattering here the, the precipitation over this downwind box over land against the sum of the sensible latent heat flux averaged over the lake. And we see this relationship where the ones with lots of flux give you lots of precipitation, and the ones with less flux give you less precipitation. Um, and particularly, these outliers with really high fluxes are the ones with really high precipitation. To convince you that it's really the, the surface scheme that's, that's responsible for this as opposed to the planetary boundary layer scheme, I can do some other experiments where, for instance, I, I switch out the surface layer scheme in these two runs um, from the one that they tend to go with with this other one. And we can see how they move on this in this regime. So for instance, this ACM one, if you just change the surface layer scheme, it goes from here down to here. So you can make it agree with the other ones just by switching out the surface layer scheme. Or in this QNSC scheme, you can just change two of the parameters, this Prandtl number and this other threshold um, U star parameter. And you can, you, you can move the result from here to here. So these very sensitive to these details of the surface layer. OK, so this shows, I've showed you that they're very different and give you some sense of why they're different. But I haven't shown you which one is right. Um, so how can we get at that? One neat data set that we can use to get at that is there's this network of lighthouses in the Great Lakes that have weather observations at the top of them. So they're out in the middle of the water, so we can actually use them to, to kind of compare with the simulations. Here's just a time series of the air temperature and the water temperature at this lighthouse, Standard Rock. Um, the observations are in black. The individual model simulations are in the colors. Um, and the observations are kind of buried by the, by the simulations here. Um, but you see that all the simulations get the more or less the temporal variability. They differ in the air temperature. And you can see, you start to see how a few schemes are warmer. Um, those are actually the schemes that had the higher fluxes. If you look at the wind speed and the water vapor mixing ratio over the event, again, you see generally the same evolution as in the observation. So this is good with some differences between the, the schemes. But what really highlights the differences between the schemes is, and what's really neat about these, these observational data is there's actually eddy covariance flux measurements on these lighthouses. So we can actually look at direct measurements of the turbulent, um, sensible, and latent heat fluxes over the lakes from, from this data set. And that's what's shown here, the sensible heat flux um, in the observations, again, in black, the model runs in the colors um, for this event. And now we can really start to say something about which one is right and which ones are wrong. So we saw these schemes that had the really high fluxes they are not at all consistent with their observations. They're, they're chugging along here with about 100 watts per meter squared extra. And then this one just goes, goes bonkers over here. So that's, that's not good. Um, similar things if you look at the latent heat fluxes in terms of the biases, um, although we're missing the observations on this plot. Um, but sim at least similar relationships between the, the runs. Um, I, won't look at, I won't talk about the momentum for now. So the last point I want to make is that these differences in how we treat the fluxes actually affects how these models respond to a temperature perturbation, which is relevant if you're trying to do regional climate change. And so we're just doing a really simple experiment here. We're not doing a full regional climate change experiment. I'm just going to warm up or cool down those prescribed lakes temperatures by 2 degrees Kelvin and rerun the simulations. This is just a kind of a proxy temperature climate sensitivity experiment. You can kind of think of it as a proxy for just changing that lake atmosphere temperature difference and seeing how the schemes respond. So we'll do this for the MYNN scheme and, scheme and the QNSE, that really high flux scheme. First, this is the sensible heat fluxes, how they change relative to the, the control. So not surprisingly, you warm up the lake, the fluxes get higher. But they get higher more in QNSE. 
and, and similar in the opposite direction. When you cool it down, the fluxes get lower, but more so in QNSE. And if you look at the precipitation, same thing, more fluxes, more precip, but more so in QNSE, less, less, less temperature or cooler lake, less precip, but more so in, in QNSE. So we can plot this in, in this kind of regime where we look at lake temperature perturbation versus the average precipitation. The crosses the QNSC, the dots are MYNN, and we see a different scaling in the, in, the two, in the two configurations where you get about 0.78 millimeters more precipitation per degree of warming in MYNN, but you get almost double that in QNSC. And if we kind of break that down and look at the fluxes, um, we see that most of that is coming because the fluxes scale more strongly with temperature in QNSC than they do in MYNN. The precip, it scales with fluxes similarly in the two. So it's really this different scaling of the fluxes with temperature that gives you this different precipitation sensitivity to, to temperature. So I'm not going to show this, but we've done this with another case over another lake, and you basically get the same results. So I'll just conclude here to say that convection permitting simulations can capture many of the attributes of these intense lake effect snowstorms, but the simulations are strongly sensitive to how the surface layer and turbulence is parameterized. Um, these parameterizations should and can be constrained through high quality observations of snowfall and, and these lake atmosphere fluxes. And these uncertainties are important because they uh, potentially affect the temperature sensitivity of lake effect snow, which will have impacts on regional climate simulation efforts. All right, thank you. Thank you very much, Justin. Uh